Boats. Big boats, little boats, sailboats, power boats. If you explore the water, it's very likely you do it from a boat, and how they work is pretty darn interesting. In this video, we're going to explore the physics behind how boats work, and at the end, we'll teach you a neat little trick to estimate how fast a boat can go simply by looking at it. In boat design, the first and most important question a designer must ask themselves is, will it float? To learn more about that, check out our video about buoyancy, which explores how and why things float. We'll be referencing some of the concepts explained in that video, so if you haven't seen it yet, hit pause now and take a look. While the buoyancy force and Archimedes principle explain why a boat floats, they don't explain how it moves. For that, we need to explore the dynamic forces that boats create. A boat will only move if a force is applied to it, whether from an engine, a sail, or even a human. Once a force is applied and a boat starts moving, things get really interesting. Just like when you push an object over a solid surface, boats that get pushed over water experience frictional resistance. And because water is a thousand times denser than air, that resistance is substantial. You can prove it to yourself by trying to run in water. You can't go nearly as fast. The resistance on a boat moving through water happens in two distinct ways, when it's moving slowly and plowing through water, and when it's moving fast and planing over water. And you need to understand both to appreciate how complex boats really are. When a boat is moving slowly, it physically plows water out of the way, creating a peak of water near the front and a pattern of waves that follow. Waves move through water at certain speeds based on how big they are. The math behind this is called the wave equation. And don't freak out. All you need to know is that the speed that waves move is a function of Earth's gravity, and most importantly for this discussion, the wavelength of the wave. The bigger the wavelength, the faster the wave moves, and vice versa. This means that when a boat moves slower through water, it creates shorter, slower waves, and when it moves faster, it creates longer, faster waves. We often refer to these waves as a boat's wake, and it is composed of two types of waves. Divergent waves that move away from the boat at an angle, these are the ones that you hit on an inner tube and fly into the air, and transverse waves that move in the same direction as the boat. Transverse waves are extremely important because they directly affect the speed of a boat when it's moving slowly. At really slow speeds, the transverse waves are short, with multiple wave peaks and troughs trailing behind along the boat hull. And as a boat speeds up, the wavelength of the trailing waves increases until eventually a limit is reached when the wavelength is equal to the length of the boat. The speed at which this happens is called a boat's hull speed. If a boat tries to go faster than its hull speed, it produces a transverse wave that is longer than the boat itself, resulting in the stern sitting low in the wave trough, the bow forced up on the wave peak, and the overall trim angle of the boat very high. Most power boaters are probably familiar with this feeling. At hull speed, if they increase the throttle, the bow of the boat raises up, the wake gets bigger, but the boat doesn't go any faster. This is because the boat is literally stuck in the transverse wave it has created. This wave roadblock was described by the English engineer and hydrodynamicist William Froude in the 1800s. He defined the speed that a boat could achieve with respect to the wave it creates with the so-called Froude number, a dimensionless ratio where L is the length of the boat's waterline, U is the boat's speed, and G is the acceleration from Earth's gravitational field. At a Froude number of about 0.4, a boat has reached its maximum efficient speed. If it tries to go any faster, the frictional resistance on the hull will go way up, requiring lots of additional power. Many boats never exceed a Froude number beyond 0.4 because either they lack power, like wind-driven sailboats or human-powered kayaks, or for high-powered boats, the efficiency of operating at that speed is so poor it just isn't worth it. Huge container ships are a great example of this. In order to go fast while also being efficient, the boats themselves have to be long, really long. You can test this concept yourself with a surfboard. Here I have two boards. One is 10 feet long and weighs about 30 pounds, while the other is 5 feet long and only weighs about 7 pounds. If I paddle as hard as I can on each board, I only move it about 3 knots on the shorter, lighter board, but 4 to 5 knots on the longer, heavier board. 
The reason I go faster on the longer board is because it can produce a longer and faster transverse wave, enabling me to maintain a faster top speed with the same applied paddling force. This same reasoning explains the efficiency and high speed of huge ships. At 950 feet long, the cruising speed of a Panamax container ship is around 25 knots, and the only reason we don't build them bigger is because the chambers of the Panama Canal aren't big enough. If they were, we'd likely build even bigger ships to improve fuel efficiency and speed. This relationship between the Frude number and a boat's halt speed means you can estimate the top efficient speed of most boats simply by looking at them, estimating their length, and doing a little math. Now for those that have a need for speed, don't worry, a boat's hull speed isn't an insurmountable barrier. You can go faster than it, but it'll cost you. You can experiment with this yourself the next time you're in a high speed power boat. As you apply more throttle, the boat will go faster and faster, up until that roadblock at a fruit number of about 0.4. At this point, to go faster, you'll have to substantially increase the applied force pushing the boat over the bow wave and into a distinctly different mode of operating, called planing. Planing in a lot of ways is simpler to explain. The resistance it creates is similar to skipping a rock over water. Here, resistance is caused primarily by the friction between the boat's surface area and the water, and scales with the speed of the boat squared. That means once you're planing, to double your speed, you must apply approximately four times more force. To overcome this, high-speed boats are designed to minimize their wetted surface area. The less area in the water, the less friction, the faster they can go. You can see this in action when watching a planing vessel underway. Very little of the actual boat is in the water. And if given enough power, a planing boat can go incredibly fast. The current world record is 318 miles an hour. So the next time you go out on the water, whether in a kayak or a research vessel, remember William Frude how to estimate a boat's top efficient speed just by looking at it, and the difference between plowing and planing. It'll remind you that applied science is all around us, and understanding how things work isn't just interesting, it makes life a lot more fun.